Kids, they make such a mess. Two years ago since the last one left us and I still find traces of them everywhere. Every day. It's got even worse since we started cleaning the place out, you know, what with the move and everything. Every room I go into, there's a reminder. Stains on the carpet, marks on the walls. The house is stuffed full of secret signs, little reminders that they left behind. Just for me. Make sure I don't forget them. Speaking of forgetting things, you'll never guess what Oscar found yesterday. Baby clothes, boxes and boxes of them in the loft behind all the old ugly furniture. Do you remember the stuff the old owners left that we thought might come in useful? <laughs> well, anyway, that's where we found them, the baby clothes. Didn't even know they were there. Makes you think, doesn't it? How did we get here? I feel like we're in that in-between stage we were in when we first moved here, when the house came furnished, and obviously not to our taste, <laughs> not anyone's taste really. <laughs> you know there was a sofa here from 1952. I know, some people just can't let go. It took us ages to make it feel like home. We didn't have any furniture of our own. Our first place was this little flat above the fish and chip shop in the high street. Kitted out by Ikea and fully equipped with a range of ever-changing sounds. <laughs> and smells. Oh, it was an experience. One night we went out to the pub with some friends and when we came back, two guys that worked there were in our kitchen cooking frozen pizza. Oscar, as you can imagine, did not mince his words and asked them what the hell they thought they were doing there. <laughs> You'll never guess what they said. <gasps> well, where else were we supposed to cook it, right? <laughs> oh, I wish I told the kids that story. Vita would have teased him mercilessly. I'm sure of it. Anyway, we got out of there as soon as we could. Well, we knew we wanted a family and that place was definitely not the right place to raise one. By the time we started house hunting, I was commuting to Watford every day. Oh, consultants were bullies and the pay was awful. And the image of the house that I was gonna buy with the pennies I'd saved was the one thing that stopped me from losing my mind. I'd already decided that I was going to have a house like the ones my Oxford friends grew up in. Old, but modern. More like palaces than houses. A family house with a spa-like bathroom and a big rustic kitchen and an endless garden. I didn't ever expect to find myself in a place like this. But somehow from the minute I walked in, I was able to picture us all here. Me, Oscar, and the children, children we didn't even have yet, but I could see them rushing out the door to school, playing hide and seek between the bushes, running towards their stockings, hanging from the mantelpiece. By Christmas, it was ours. And by Easter, we'd really made it ours. Oscar spent relentless weekends rolling back moth-eaten carpets and peeling rotting paint from the walls. He's always been creative. Creative but practical. And incredibly patient. I've never had a garden before, but there I was outside every Saturday, hacking away at hedges, yanking up weeds from between the patio tiles, stuffing every spare space with flowers I couldn't even name. We even discussed a vegetable patch at one point. <laughs> and chickens. Oh, it was the height of spring and I just found out I was pregnant with Jessie. I didn't have my palace and I was still trapped in Watford, but somehow it didn't matter. Light came flooding into our world at an alarming rate and I just didn't want it to stop. 
I still can't quite believe it all came together as well as it did. The garden, I mean. No homegrown veg or chickens. I'm still proud of myself. I just wish... There's just one thing about this place I never got quite right. The cherry tree at the bottom of the garden. Its branches were bare when we arrived. It was winter, too chilly for new life. But I just knew instinctively what it was. You see, we went to Paris for our honeymoon. It was springtime and there were blossoms everywhere, not like here. These were thick, luminous flowers that wrapped around the city's neck like a garland. You know what? That's probably my happiest memory. That first morning, we were up early waiting for the Louvre to open, for the canal pocket, trying to not look like tourists. And I was feeling sick from the sun, so Oscar suggested we sat down somewhere. And we found this tiny deserted park and almost every inch of it was shaded by these trees aching with blossoms. The branches bent so low I could hold the petals in my hand. We never made it to the Louvre. Being alone and together in this small paradise. was enough. I waited years for our tree to bloom. I watered it. I starved it. Some years I turned over the soil. Sometimes I let it be. Year after year I waited for those blossoms, but they never came. There were lots of wills. This will make a good nursery. This will make a good playroom. But none of it quite came together. Still, we made a nice house for ourselves. And we've had some nice times here together. Oscar and me. Now it's time for somebody else to enjoy it. And I have to be honest, it couldn't go to a nicer couple. Felicity and David. <laughs> we met them last Sunday. They just turned up out of the blue. They were in the neighborhood, wanted to say hello and have another look at the house. Dave says they've got big plans for it. Lots of changes on the cards. They'll probably just end up gutting the whole place. And we had a cup of tea and we chatted. Felicity's a biology teacher and Dave works in a city insurance, I think. And that's where they live at the moment, west somewhere. And it's not a good place to raise a family. And thank goodness they found this place. And they weren't sure if they were going to be able to find somewhere in time. When's the baby due? January. How exciting for you both. They smile at us and then at each other. Love is elastic between them, flying back and forth. And then Felicity looks at us and says, do you have any children? I don't quite know what to say. Oscar and I have had four children. Jesse was our firstborn son. And he arrived at midday on the cars from a blazing afternoon on the hottest day of the year. He lived for six hours. Pandora followed two years later. 
Maybe it was the incubator distorting things, but she looked impossibly tiny. Impossible was the word the doctors used a lot over those three days. And we had Matthew. I wish we'd had some time with him. Even a few minutes would have been nice. And finally, Vita. Defiant little Vita. I remember hearing her heartbeat on the monitor and thinking, she is a strong baby. She'll stick around. But there I was again in the middle of the night, another ruined mattress. I had to throw away my favorite pajamas. There was no way I was gonna get the stains out. I'd already tried with Jessie. I'd soaked and scrubbed that dress day after day until it looked almost brand new. And I caught sight of myself. I looked like I was wearing a shroud. They treat you differently when they know. They try hard with me, the other mothers. All mothers. They stop and chat and sometimes they invite me around for a cup of tea, tea and sympathy. That's all I get is sympathy. It's never said out loud, but they say it in other ways. Like how they stop talking when you come round the corner. How they never say their child's name without a blush of guilt. How they look at you with big wide eyes and full smiles, pleasantry streaming from their mouths. And their unsaid words screaming above their heads. Poor miscarriage melody. No children, no love. No life. And I just want to look them in the face and say, I am more than just this. Just because this part of my life is empty, it doesn't make the whole thing redundant. I have a first class degree. I have a dream job. I get to do research and make things that really change people's lives, really make a difference. I have wonderful sisters and parents and the nicest group of friends. My body may not have created life, but the life I have created, that has meaning. And that should be enough. That's what Oscar says. He tells me that I am a strong and successful woman, and that he's lucky to know me. And that sometimes he's just in awe of me. And some days, I think it's true. But then I'll stop and chat to a local parent in the supermarket or overhear something in the station waiting room or see a picture of my best friend's daughter. And I realise that he's wrong. It's not enough. And I want to be one of them more than anything. That's what I want. And I know I never will be. But two years since Vita, 18 months since we stopped trying, I still imagine myself there. Moving will help. My new job is an opportunity, I think, to give myself a fresh start. <sighs> you can't get much of a fresh start than moving to Glasgow. And Oscar's going to stay in the area for now. He's looking at a place on an Ivy Terrace. I mean, the contract's only for a year after that. I mean, we'll see. I'm not saying that's it. We're finished. But I can't bring myself to pretend anymore. Not even to him. Maybe Felicity and David would like some of the old baby clothes. I mean, they're almost as good as new. 
I hope they will be happy in this house. I think we could have been. I'm sure we would have been had things been different. The garden is the thing they're most excited about. Felicity says her sister is a landscaper and she's going to help her make everything nice. My new house doesn't have much of a garden. I won't even consider getting chickens. I don't mind though. I'll have my fill of nature. I'll be walking through a big park every day on my way to work. Not Paris. It's better than nothing. Do you remember when there was that storm down here last Saturday? Well, up there, it was boiling. Hottest day of the decade, the estate agent said. And after I signed all the paperwork, I went for a walk and I found myself in this park full of unfamiliar faces and velvety green grass, voices clamouring to be heard above the traffic jams and football games that sound, sent balls bouncing across my path. And I just stood there for a while, watching the world go by. It's a world that still terrifies me and I'm still not sure I want to be part of it. But yet in that moment, I don't want to say I felt happy, but seeing the sun the sky and the university spire piercing a single cloud. I felt still. I felt ready. I wonder what this place will be like when I'm gone. I bet there'll be a vegetable patch and a whole new set of carpets. New paint on the walls. All the traces will be scrubbed out. And that tree will bloom. 